Welcome to the next lecture on graph data formats. Today, we will talk about common RDF vocabularies. As a reminder, uh, the RDF data model is a graph data model where uh, we have a set of uh, so-called triples or statements. And each of those triples or statements have uh, three, has three parts, a subject, a predicate, and an object. Uh, last time we talked about uh, Sparkle and the lecture before we talked about uh, uh, the RDF data model itself and its uh, or some of its serializations. Um, in this slide and uh, throughout this lecture, we will stick to the RDF turtle representation. The nodes in the RDF graph are called resources or things and um, those resources or things are connected uh, using edges, uh, also called predicates or properties. And those edges also are labeled with IRIs. Um, and um, the reason for that is that you can uh, actually go to that URI or URL in that case and uh, read or get a human readable or end machine readable representation of what that particular predicate uh, actually means, uh, such as the human readable label, description, and so on. Next, we talked about uh, classes, which are uh, resources like uh, all resources in the RDF data model. However, uh, the first thing we want to say about any resource basically is uh, the type of that resource. So for instance, here we have a resource uh, which represents an employee and we want to say that this employee is a person. And we do that using the RDF type predicate. RDF type stands for an IRI. Uh, and this is its prefixed version. And we say that uh, this employee is a person. Um, and my person in this case is again an IRI. It's a node represented or identified by this IRI and it repre represents the class person which can be viewed as a set of all people uh, which belong to this class. And uh, also uh, we say that this is the type of the resource. So the type of the employee is person. So this is the way we talk about uh, uh, resources in RDF. And uh, I have mentioned classes and predicates and that they are identified by IRIs. And um, we already mentioned that uh, those the, the meanings of those IRIs, the meanings of the IRIs of predicates and classes are defined in vocabularies, which are, which are both machine and human readable um, <coughs> documents uh, saying uh, which IRIs are defined and what they actually mean um, so that uh, people publishing or applications publishing uh, RDF data can use those vocabularies and the predicates and classes defined in them to properly describe uh, the data in an interoperable way um, <clears throat> so that uh, data from multiple sources can be viewed as coming from one because they use the same vocabularies, predicates and classes for the same uh, data or for the data with a similar meaning. What we didn't talk about is uh, particular vocabularies. We have seen some uh, predicates and some classes and we have played with the fourth vocabulary a little bit, but uh, still we didn't talk about any particular vocabularies properly. Uh, I showed you the RDFS vocabulary, which is RDF schema, which serves for definition of those vocabularies. But today I will show you some uh, most mostly used vocabularies uh, on the web of data. And we'll start with uh, the Dublin Core vocabulary. Uh, so a little bit of motivation for this. Uh, let's say that uh, the first thing we want to say about any resource in RDF is its type. And the second thing typically is uh, a human readable name of the thing. So uh, name of a data set or name of a person, name of an organization. And what would happen quite naturally with uh, multiple publishers publishing their data, one would uh, name this property name, 
another one would name it a label and uh, another one could name it title for instance and then we would have uh, three data sets from those publishers each using a different property for naming a thing which wouldn't help with interoperability because what would be better um, would be if there was a standard saying if you want to state a name of a thing use this particular predicate for that so that everyone can understand it and this uh, basically uh, is what was happening in 1995 in uh, Dublin but it is not that Dublin uh, you might know from Ireland it is another Dublin uh, in the United States and um, it was the librarians community that came together and uh, they defined first 15 uh, predicates and uh, they made a consensus on what those predicates actually precisely mean and uh, they started using those predicates or properties for describing books at that time of course it was not uh, represented in RDF the metadata about those books uh, it was in XML or maybe other formats um, but that doesn't really matter all it matters is that uh, they agreed on those properties conceptually uh, and uh, they agreed on what those properties exactly mean since today we are talking about RDF vocabularies those properties eventually came into the RDF world and um, those properties are now being used in um, well majority of uh, of RDF datasets I would say um, what is important to say is there are two namespaces or prefixes that appear in connection to Dublin Core. The first one is the elements uh, namespace or prefix. Uh, common, the prefix is named DC commonly and uh, this one is deprecated for our purposes because its definition is too vague to be properly used uh, on the web of data. However, there is the second prefix, Dublin Core Terms or DC Terms, which uh, you have already seen used and uh, we will be using uh, to describe the basic properties of uh, almost anything. It uh, doesn't have to be books. Um, those properties are also used, for instance, for data sets uh, or any other digital object that has uh, those basic properties such as a title, a description, a publisher, a date issued and so on. Uh, what's uh, important or interesting to say also is that uh, the uh, Dublin Core initiative uh, didn't finish in 1995. Actually, there was an update in 2020 uh, to, um, to how uh, the vocabulary is defined. Uh, so this initiative is still, still alive. Here we see a publisher, the full URI and the prefixed DC Terms publisher uh, form. And we can see the human readable label, which is publisher. We can see a longer definition, which is that a publisher is an entity responsible for making the resource available, where the resource we can imagine a book or a data set. And uh, we see that this is a property or a predicate. Uh, for classes, there will be class. And now uh, the, uh, the thing that uh, was the reason for the 2020 update we see range includes and uh, there we see an IRI of a class agent. So there is a class Dublin Core DC Terms agent uh, and uh, where we say here that whenever we use publisher um, the object may be of, um, of uh, the type agent. Now if uh, you remember um, RDFS uh, I showed you an example where basically uh, it was saying that for a property we can define a range and then for the same property if we define another range in that example it was a weight of a motor vehicle and uh, a book and we were talking about domain but the effect is basically the same um, there was a problem because when we said that uh, the property weight has a domain book and a mot motor vehicle then any instance that would use this property would become an instance of a book and a motor vehicle at the same time, which was quite unintuitive. 
and uh, this was the same case here with uh, Dublin Core because originally uh, DCTEMS publisher had a range uh, defined using RDFS and it was this agent which meant that every time the publisher property was used the object became uh, an instance of this agent and uh, this was a source of some problems so in the 2020 update they changed those definitions and now instead of uh, the hard RDFS definition of range uh, they have their own definition range includes and this is more of a hint that uh, typically the objects of the publisher are of this type but it doesn't mean from the RDFS point of view that they become this type uh, and uh, also uh, the range includes can now have multiple values and it has the usual or um, intuitive meaning that um, the objects may be of any of those values but it doesn't mean that they have to be um, they have to be uh, of all the types at once which was the problem with rdfs okay and now um, the last bullet here says that um, the publisher is a sub property of uh, and uh, here we have another publisher and notice uh, that uh, um, <clears throat> this is the publisher from the elements namespace. So uh, the original na elements namespace containing the original 15 pr uh, predicates uh, is still there and it is connected to the DC terms ones using uh, sub um, However, uh, those proper definitions are in the DC terms namespace and uh, the conclusion from this is uh, whenever you are publishing data and you have metadata that fits Dublin Core, use the DC terms namespace for that. An overview of <clears throat> what can be found uh, in uh, the DC terms namespace is here uh, with the most important items uh, enlarged here. So we can he here see the, the title, the description, creator, created, issued, publisher, source, subject, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so this serves more of well, like like an overview of what uh, you can expect to find in the Dublin Core uh, vocabulary and what you might want to use for your data if your data contains something with a similar meaning. And we have already seen the usage of uh, Dublin Core in our uh, RDF example where we had a catalog and uh, we had its name and description connected using Dublin Core title and description properties. The next vocabulary we will talk about today is SCOS, Simple Knowledge Organization System. Um, imagine some code lists or taxonomies that look like this. Those are basically lists of possible values of some properties. For instance, in the study information system, you may have grades from A to F and uh, you cannot get any other grade than uh, one from A to F. And um, you can see that each grade has a code, A, B, C, D, E, F, and a human readable label such as excellent, very good, good, satisfactory, sufficient, failed, and so on. Uh, this uh, may also be something else uh, like a type of uh, qualification thesis or uh, type of a tourist attraction and so on. So lists of possible values like these are what we call code lists or taxonomies. And uh, those are very common in data. And um, the, the usual problem is here as well. So when one publisher decides to publish such a list of possible values and another does the same, they probably will end up with a very different representation. Here, um, it is good that um, there really is only one vocabulary uh, in the web of data used for those kinds of things, and that is SCOS. This was not the case with uh, labels and titles. Uh, I showed you Dublin Core, uh, but also we have RDFS, which also has a predicate label. And as we'll see in SCOS, there is yet another property for labels. So with labels, it's not so uh, not so clear which one to use. Um, but with um, with taxonomies or code lists, 
uh, SCOS is used always. So uh, for Coalesce, this is a good thing. And um, this is again a W3C recommendation from 2009. Uh, and now I'll introduce to you uh, the basic concepts of SCOS. And the first basic concept is a concept. So SCOS concept is a class representing an idea, a notion, a unit of, of thought, which has a very broad meaning. And it is true that uh, almost anything can be typed as a SCOS concept. However, in our use case for codist items, we will use SCOS concept as a class uh, to indicate that this is a codist item. So coming back to the example of a list of uh, tourist uh, attraction types, here we have one from, uh, from TripAdvisor and uh, we all represent sites and landmarks here. So sites and landmarks is from the RDF point of view a resource. So we will attach an IRI to it. And as a type, we will say it's a SCOS concept. And uh, this will go for all the, uh, all the code list items uh, we can see there. So like this we'll have all the codest items identified and typed as SCOS concepts. Now, to be able to work with um, the code list itself as a whole, uh, we need another class. And uh, the class representing the code list itself or a grouping of concepts is a SCOS concept scheme. So SCOS concept scheme is um, a group, an aggregation of one or more concepts. In our example, uh, the sites and landmarks concept will belong to this concept scheme. So the concept scheme, again, is a thing. We'll attach an IRI to it. We'll say it's a concept scheme. And now it will have one concept and uh, that will be the sites and landmarks. Uh, we will say this using the SCOS in scheme predicate. We'll say that the sites and landmarks concept belongs to this concept scheme. Um, and uh, you can see that there are two more predicates uh, shown here. And that is has top concept and SCOS top concept of. The list of tourist attraction types uh, that is shown in the slide is a flat one. It has just one level. But it may, uh, or we can easily imagine that this, this classification will have multiple levels. For instance, there will be uh, at the top, there will be tourist attraction, then there will, there will be a level saying, uh, for instance, it's a family attraction or it's an attraction for teenagers. And um, the level uh, below that will be concerts and shows as a family attraction. And then, uh, for instance, some intense roller coasters as uh, attractions for teens, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> in that case, when we have a hierarchical concept scheme, it makes sense to point to the top of the hierarchy or the root. And that's where the top concept uh, points, the predicate of the concept scheme. And uh, also we can indicate this using an inverse property top concept of um, from the concept pointing to the concept scheme uh, of which it is a top concept. Right, so now we have um, all the code list items and the code lists themselves identified using IRIs. We have the proper types specified and we have connected the code list items to the concept schemes, to the code lists. This is, this is fine. However, we are missing basically all the necessary data. Uh, we have just IRIs and types and that is it. What we need to add are the labels of those items so that we can show those items to uh, human users in the end, in our applications, for instance. And for that, we need tools to, uh, to attach human readable labels to those, uh, to those objects or uh, resources. And we'll start with something called a preferred label. So each code list item or each uh, resource can have a preferred label. The label that the publisher says, this is the label to be used with this item. So this is a preferred label. It is a label in a natural language. So 
the objects are always literals with language tags and there may be one preferred label per human or natural language. So there may be for one code list item, there may be one preferred label in Czech and another preferred label in English, but there may not be two preferred labels for English because that doesn't make any sense. And from the fact that we have a preferred label, it is now clear that we will also have another kinds uh, or other kinds of labels. Um, the first other kind is uh, an alternate label. Alternate labels are all those that are not preferred and there may be multiple per each language. And finally, the third kind of label that SCOS defines is a hidden label. This may sound a bit uh, weird. Why would we indicate a label that we will hide? But this has a good reason. Uh, imagine a system that will allow you to search through uh, the code list items, for instance, uh, in a form where you need to fill in um, a type from this code list. And um, you know that uh, as a publisher, you know that one of those code list items is often misspelled and you still want to enable your users to find this code list item, even with the bad spelling. Uh, but you do not want this bad spelling to then be used to show the, uh, the value of this, uh, of this label. And this is what um, hidden labels in SCOS are for. So you can um, attach other labels used for a specific concept, which uh, may not be uh, correct or preferred or, um, or, or endorsed in uh, any way but they are still uh, necessary to be there so that, people, uh, so that people can find those items using those bad labels. An example here is a concept which has a preferred label in English, in French, an alternate label in English and in French, and there is one hidden label with a uh, misspelling in English. So this is how you can represent a concept and it's uh, three kinds of labels. Now we talked about uh, codes of items um, in the, in the uh, study information system example. Uh, there were grades which had the human readable labels like excellent, uh, sufficient and so on. But there were also codes A, B, C. Those codes primarily used by uh, machines can also be represented in SCOS and uh, there is a predicate for that and that predicate is SCOS notation. Since the values of SCOS notation are not in a natural language but they are intended to be machine readable, uh, the literals will not have language tags here but uh, they will have um, data types and the data types may also be custom data types. So we talked about um, the mostly used data types being from the XML schema data types hierarchy. But since the data types are identified by IRIs, uh, you can of course define your own IRIs. And in SCOS, this is recommended if your notation follows some, some syntax. Uh, for instance, here, if your uh, notation always has three numbers, a dot and four numbers, it is a good idea to, uh, to use your custom data type here and then uh, describe the data type in some way. A full SCOS concept scheme example can be seen here. It is an example of um, a code list of continents. This is an actual European code list of, uh, of continents. And we can see IRIs for the individual concepts. We can see the preferred labels in many languages and um, we see that those concepts are connected to a concept scheme which as well has uh, different labels. Now note that here the concept scheme has two labels, RDFS label and SCOS pref label. And uh, this is exactly because uh, it is, there is no one way or no one correct way or preferred way to specify a label of a concept scheme. Uh, it is common to specify that using SCOS pref label and it is also common to specify that using RDFS label. And this is the reason that both of those are used here because some applications may search for RDFS label, some other applications may search for SCOS pref label and uh, since 
both of those are used here. Both applications will show the human readable label of this concept scheme. Of course, this presents uh, a duplicity and redundancy, but um, this is okay because uh, the goal of RDF is not uh, to be concise. Uh, it is more uh, to be interoperable. So it is prefer uh, preferable to um, for, for the data to be as conveniently used for applications as possible. Right, so like this, we are able to represent flat concept schemes with one, uh, with one level. But uh, as uh, I have already mentioned, uh, there are hierarchical code lists and we need to support those. And uh, SCOS offers a um, set of predicates that will help us represent those. And the set of predicates has an abstract predicate, which is um, never used in actual data, uh, but it uh, is an abstract parent of all those uh, specific predicates which are used in the data. So the abstract one is SCOS semantic relation. So all those relations are semantic relations and uh, those actually used in the data are the SCOS related, which says one, concept is somehow related to another, but we don't specify in which way. Um, but we specify that there is a relation. So it still might be valuable to specify this. Uh, it might be better to specify that there is some kind of relation than uh, not to specify it at all when we know that there is some kind of relation. And when we know that uh, one concept is somehow uh, narrower than another one, we can connect the narrower one to the broader one using the SCOS broader uh, predicate, which is the short red arrow. And uh, if it is the other way around, we know that um, one co the, the broader concept <clears throat> is, well, broader than a narrower one. Then from the broader, we can use the SCOS narrower predicates to point to the narrower one. And using those two properties, we can represent a hierarchy of concepts. Now, uh, the question is, uh, what's, uh, what's up with the broader transitive and narrower transitive uh, predicates? Now, those two should uh, not be used in uh, data itself explicitly. However, they can be inferred from the data. So uh, in the image, in the slide, we have a concept D, which points using SCOS broader to uh, the concept B, which points using SCOS broader to the concept A. Now, given this data and the knowledge of SCOS, we can infer that D is transitive, uh, D points to A, which is the long red arrow, using the broader transitive predicate. So the transitive predicates uh, are used for inferred triples, not for those explicitly mentioned in the data. Now, one addition to SCOS is collections. It may happen that uh, there is a group of concepts which have something common, and we want to say that something in the data, but they do not uh, comprise a SCOS concept scheme. Um, well, in that case, there is a SCOS collection, which is just a collection of concepts and other collections. Um, there is a type for that, and uh, it is mostly reused in other vocabularies. Uh, but it might happen that uh, you might uh, you might need this one. What's uh, interesting here is that there is a ordered collection variant which uses uh, a SCOS member lists uh, member list predicate to point to a linked list, which is the RDF list with the um, uh, with the regular uh, brackets um, syntactic shortcut in RDF Turtle, which is shown here. So if you have an unordered collection, you use the SCOS member predicates to point to the collections and concepts in that collection. And uh, if you have a ordered collection, you may indicate that using SCOS member list. Right, so this is uh, basically all that SCOS offers to, to represent uh, flat and hierarchical code lists or concept schemes. Uh, another common situation which may happen is that uh, we have one uh, SCOS concept scheme for, let's say, um, tourist attractions coming from TripAdvisor, and we might have another one 
also for tourist collection, uh, tourist attraction types, but this time coming from, let's say, Foursquare. And those concept schemes represent the same domain, tourist attraction types, but they do it in slightly different way because they are curated by different publishers, let's say. Uh, this on the web happens quite a lot and uh, there is a support for, for this uh, use case in SCOS and uh, this support is in, um, in uh, mappings. So uh, as we had uh, a semantic relation as an abstract property for all uh, those broader and narrower properties, here we have a mapping relation which again is an abstract property um, for uh, in, for the other properties, the specific ones, which indicate that uh, one concept from one concept scheme is somehow related to, so matches in, um, in uh, or Hauskos um, names this, so matches a concept from another concept scheme. And there may be different kinds of matches. There may be a close match, so one concept is uh, approximately the same thing as another concept. This property is not transitive because if that other concept is approximately the same as uh, a concept from a third concept scheme, then uh, it will probably not hold that the first concept is approximately the same as the, uh, the last concept. If we are sure that the first concept is the same as another, uh, concept, then we can use the SCOS exact match, which is what is happening in the example here, where we have a code list of uh, human sexes and uh, we have um, an item for female sex and there, is, um, and there is an exact match to two other concept schemes that represent the same thing. Then it might happen that there is a match, but uh, again, we are not sure or we do not uh, know how to specify its nature. So it's a related match, which is the same meaning as the SCOS related uh, predicate uh, within a concept scheme. So we have a SCOS related match predicate between two concepts from different concept schemes. And the same goes for a broad match and narrow match. So we may say that um, that one concept from one, one concept scheme um, has a broader concept in another concept scheme. Right, so this was a simple knowledge organization system, SCOS, used for code lists and taxonomies and classifications. The next vocabulary we will talk about is called good relations. And uh, this vocabulary is for e-commerce. Um, it is used by uh, many, many publishers of uh, web pages and content on the web. Uh, what's interesting here is that it is syntax neutral. So it has a representation in RDF Turtle, which is what we will, uh, uh, we will see in the slides. But it also has representations in um, JSON or in microdata, which is data embedded in web pages um, and so on. It is industry neutral, which means that it can be used for any kind of e-commerce. Um, and um, there is a rich snippet generator, which is uh, quite a nice tool, uh, which is basically a form where you can fill in the data you want represented and it will generate the good relations representation of that data for you. Um, now, before we get uh, into um, the description of good relations, let's take a look at the linked open vocabularies catalog. Um, the catalog, as I mentioned already, lists the vocabularies used in the web of data. And um, I didn't talk about what the actual size of those circles in that diagram uh, mean. Uh, you see, there is the, the rule that uh, if uh, you are creating a new vocabulary, you do not reinvent the wheel. You do not uh, define new properties to represent the same thing that uh, properties from already existing vocabularies already use uh, or, uh, or already uh, mean. Uh, so if there is, for instance, DC terms title uh, and uh, in your data you have titles of things and um, the definition of DC terms title fits your data, you should not invent a new IRI 
for the same thing, you should reuse the DC times one instead. And uh, this is where the size of the circles in this diagram uh, comes in because uh, the bigger the circle, uh, the more vocabularies we use the uh, vocabulary represented by the circle. So this means that the DC times vocabulary is the most reused one. It's uh, not exactly true because uh, this diagram actually hides the first one or two uh, vocabularies, which are, uh, or one of them is RDFS, I think, because that one is actually used by all the vocabularies because it is used to define them. Uh, but the, the meaningful ones uh, basically almost always reuse Dublin core terms, DC terms, and that is why the DC terms cycle is the biggest one in, uh, in the diagram. And then we can see FOLF, which is the friend of a friend vocabulary, which we used in the tutorials. Then we can see SCOS, which we talked about just now. And uh, the position of good relations is um, shown using the arrow. So now you should know how to read the uh, linked open vocabularies diagram. So the bigger the circle, the more reused vocabulary in other vocabularies. And now let's get an overview of uh, the good relations vocabulary. So we have already seen some conceptual diagrams uh, modeling some domain, right? So in this case, this is the conceptual um, or actually not conceptual because this one is already mapped to, uh, to the vocabulary, but it is an overview diagram uh, of uh, the good relations vocabulary. On, in this case, it's called an ontology. Um, in, uh, in my lectures, I will use the term ontology and vocabulary, uh, both uh, meaning uh, the list of classes and properties to be used in data. Um, however, uh, when I was talking about conceptual modeling, I mentioned that conceptual modeling has uh, or is very close to how RDA, uh, or how graph data uh, then looks like, because the graph data represents the data in the most natural way, how it is in the real world. So that is why the conceptual diagram and the diagram of a particular vocabulary is basically um, the same. Um, because the, the vocabulary covers the reality, which is modeled by a conceptual diagram. Right, so uh, the, the overview of good relations might seem a bit um, complex, but uh, don't worry, we will go through it. And in the end, you'll see that it is actually not so complex. Uh, the good relations uh, modeling approach revolves around four basic uh, building blocks. The first one is uh, an agent who is a person or an organization. And for representation of an agent, there is the good relations business entity class. So whenever we will talk about an agent, a person or an organi organization, we'll say that it is of the uh, good relations business entity type. Now, uh, whenever we'll use um, or represent a service or an object, uh, we'll use the good relations product or service for that. So a camcorder, a house, a car, or a service like a haircut. Those are all products or services. Um, <clears throat> now, the third building block is an offering. So the offering represents, um, well, the, the promise to transfer some rights to uh, on the object, basically to sell something or to buy something or to provide a service for a certain compensation, so to give someone a haircut. So that's the offering. And uh, finally, the fourth building block is uh, location, because those services are offered somewhere, uh, and the things like houses and cars are sold or being uh, or bought somewhere. And uh, typically, when you have a business entity, it will have a location such as a shop somewhere. So that's a location. So those are the four main building blocks of the good relations vocabulary, and they are called the agent promise object principle. And now we'll go through them individually and uh, we'll see how they are modeled using good relations. And we'll start with the business entity. Uh, so here in the example, uh, you may see a organization, which is a business entity, and it has a legal name 
um, ACME Bagel Bake Real Limited. Now, just a few moments ago, I was talking about uh, the reuse of vocabularies and how we had multiple uh, predicates for naming things like RDFS label, um, SCOS prep label, DC terms title. Well, here we have another one, good relations legal name. But this one uh, has a specific and this one is saying that actually this name of the organization is the legal name in some registry. So it is the proper legal name, not just uh, some brand, for instance. So this is okay to, uh, to create a property like this because this one is more specific than the generic uh, DC terms title because DC terms title does not talk about uh, the title being uh, legal in, in any way. So in this case, we have a new predicate. But as you can see in the example, the rest of the predicates are reused from other vocabularies. So um, to, to indicate that the business entity has a page, we use the fourth page property from the friend of a friend vocabulary. We do not invent our own. And then there is um, the rest of the items is from schema.org, which I will talk about uh, a little bit today as well but it is a universal vocabulary for almost anything and parts of, of this vocabulary are used in uh, in good relations as well so here we have a representation of a of an address a telephone fax number and email for those for, for this business entity the underlined uh, class and uh, the underlined predicate are the only two things which are specifically defined in good relations to uh, represent business entities. The rest is reused from other vocabularies. Now, the location. Well, here uh, the location will be a, a specific restaurant. In this case, it's a bagel restaurant in Munich. And uh, in this example, the location class is again the only thing specific to good relations. Um, this is not exactly true because there is the good relations name, but this one is actually specified to be the same as schema name, um, schema.org name. So it is not exactly new. Um, and uh, the exact reasons for um, it being redefined, um, I will not go into at this moment. Then there is again an address of the location uh geo coordinates and a telephone number for the location so all properties you would expect from a description of a business location now uh, a location should have a specification of opening hours now this is a interesting uh, moment because uh, it shows you some of the modeling decisions that you need to make uh, when you are creating a vocabulary so the opening hour specification could be modeled uh, in different ways. Uh, and this is uh, how it is modeled in good relations. There is one instance uh, of a type opening hours specification and uh, which specifies the opening time, the closing time, and then the days of a week on which this opening and closing time uh, is valid. And if you need uh, to represent two opening times, like in the example that uh, in some days or on some days you have open, lo the, the location is open from 8 to 12 and then from 13 to 20, you need two instances of uh, the opening hour specification because the instance is defined by the opening and closing time. So in this case, we have uh, opened from, we are open from uh, 8 to 12, from Monday to Friday, and then on Friday there is also an opening uh, time between 1 and 8 uh, in the afternoon. Right, um, so we talked about the location and its opening hour specification and the business entity. Now let's talk about the offering, so the promise to buy or sell something or provide a service. Um, here we have a class, good relations offering, and a name and description. And um, now here we have lots of uh, new predicates. Uh, we have the business function, which indicates whether we are selling or buying something. We have a textual description of the condition of the thing we are buying or selling. Then some um, 
good specific predicates like EN code and uh, some, uh, some other uh, identifiers. Then there is a representation of uh, how many items are in stock. That's the has inventory level. And to note that it's not just a value. It uh, uses a separate entity, which is of a type uh, quantitative value. And we'll talk about modeling the quantitative and qualitative values in a bit. Uh, then there is an aggregate rating. Now, uh, this is what is then used, for instance, by Google um, to show uh, how many stars does a product um, represented on a web page um, have. Um, and um, then there is a depiction, an image of the thing and a full page. So this is a representation of an offering. And um, the, the final piece of information is a price specification. Now, this is again an interesting moment because it applies, uh, this, this type of modeling applies to um, all representations of uh, something that has a unit and, uh, 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 and a value. Uh, such as uh, the, the inventory level, but this is specifically for uh, prices. Um, there is a class for a regular price specification, and this is a more specific class for unit price specification. So now the offering has a price specification, which is a unit price specification. And it says that uh, uh, this offering, which is for a controller card, um, has a price of 99.99 USD. Um, the important thing is here is that uh, for prices, we always split the currency and the value uh, because those are two different things and we do not, do not combine them into, into one literal. And in addition, you may say that this price is valid through and a date time uh, through which a price is valid. So this is, uh, this is an offering. So now we have a business, uh, we have a location, we have an offering, and what's left here is to, to talk about the actual product or service being offered. Uh, now there are three main types of, um, of things uh, represented in good relations. We'll start with a real product. When you have a specific thing you want to buy or sell, for instance, a specific car, a specific laptop with its serial number, it can be bought or sold only once. And then uh, this thing is of a type good relations individual. So this one is quite clear. Then there is uh, the opposite of, uh, of this, which is a product model. So let's say um, here we have examples of a camera, Nikon T90 or an iPod Nano 16 gigabytes. Um, those are product models and uh, many specific uh, instances of this product model may be sold or bought. Uh, so in this case, um, it's a product or service model. So this is basically what you will typically find in, uh, in e-shops. And the first thing is um, um, what you'll typically find in like secondhand shops and so on. Uh, and then there is a, a third type which is um, a black box of products. Uh, so there may be, for instance, a page for a new book and there are multiple ones in stock. Um, the, the offering does not list the individual books, so they are not individuals, uh, but at the same time, they may have, um, uh, they may have some uh, uh, differences, like one is uh, more used than the other and so on. Uh, so it is not clear whether it is an individual or a product or service model. Uh, and also it might not hold that statements about uh, this um, black box um, hold for all instances of individual items in this black box, uh, which is the case for a product or service model. So if you have this um, something in between state, so you have a black box of products, um, then there is a support for that in good relations in the form of the good relations some items class. And we'll have a specific um, specific example here. We have a Volkswagen Beetle, which is a specific one. It, it is my Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, so this is an individual. And it has a name and a description. 
and uh, that's it. On the other hand, we have an example of a product or service model, which is a uh, color television here. Um, it's not a specific one, it is the whole model and it has a EN code and it has dimensions like width and height. Uh, again, note that the value here is, um, is specified as a quantitative value uh, with uh, the value and the units of measurement separated. Um, right. And then there is an example of the sum items instance where we have some cameras uh, of, uh, of this type. And uh, yeah, there is some depiction and a page, uh, but it is not necessarily uh, the same as uh, the product or service model. Well, so we have described the business entity, the location, the offering and the product or uh, products or services individually. And uh, for all this to make sense, we need to link the instances. So the business entities, uh, good relations offers the offerings, then the offerings include products or services and the business entities have points of service POS. So it has POS links the business entity to a location. So this is how the, all, all of this comes together um, into, into a meaningful data set. Now, I promised you to talk a bit more about quantitative and qualitative values. So we'll start with the quantitative value. Here, it is any value that has, well, a number as a value and uh, then some units. Uh, for instance, here we have an electric anvil and it has a weight in kilograms. Um, so this is a quantitative value, a separate resource, which has the value and the units of measurement separated. And then it has a supported voltage, which has a minimum and maximum value. So this is also possible to, to represent using good relations. Now, one interesting fact here is that uh, according to good relations, the units of measurement are actually literals from the code list, which is linked from the slide. You may, uh, you may uh, have a look. It's a UNC fact common codes code list. And um, for the common units, there are these, uh, these um, codes. So for meter, is, it's MTR. For meter squared, it is MTK. For kilograms, K KGM. And um, Sometimes it might happen that you just want to say that there is like 30 pieces of something, so no unit. And for no unit, there is a code uh, C62. So it's just a code. It sometimes doesn't make any sense, but it is um, used um, in good relations. So it is good to know that there is a code list with all those, uh, all those units defined. So... Um, you know how to represent those if those come up in your data. So this is quantitative value. Quantitative because it is a quantity, it has a number. Uh, the opposite is a qualitative value, which does not uh, represent a number. So for instance, here we have garment sizes. So sizes of t-shirts, let's say. Um, and uh, for that, we create a class. Now here, uh, you may notice that we don't have RDFS class, but we have OWL class, but um, you don't need to worry about the difference right now. So instead of OWL class, you may imagine RDFS class, it will be the same. So we create a class, gamma and size, and we say that this class is a subclass of qualitative value. So by this, we are saying this is a class for our qualitative value specifications. And then we have the individual possible values of this qualitative value, for instance, M and L as garment sizes. So those are instances of this newly created class. They have human readable labels and they may have some uh, predefined relations. For instance, good relations uh, defines a relation lesser and greater. So M is lesser than L and L is greater than M. Um, <clears throat> so now we have the values of uh, this qualitative value defined and we need to talk about how to actually use those values when describing a product or service. So for that we need to define a property. Again here we define the property using OWL but uh, we may as well see uh, RDF property here. Uh, 
So a size is a property, a uh, sub-property of qualitative uh, product or service property, again, to connect it to uh, good relations. And um, um, yeah, the range is the newly defined class. And there is, again, a human readable label. And then we have a specific T-shirt, uh, which has a name and color, and it connects uh, to the uh, to the created garment size M using the created uh, property full size. So this is how you would um, you would uh, model a qualitative value, not only in good relations but also in other vocabularies. And uh, if we go back to the overview diagram of good relations, we'll see that. Uh, we went through uh, most of it. There are some areas which we didn't talk about, but the main areas with the biggest boxes uh, we talked about. Now, um, good relations got uh, somehow imported into another bigger vocabulary called schema.org. Um, so let me talk for a bit about schema.org because uh, you may run into schema.org a lot when, uh, when using the web of data. Um, schema.org is a vocabulary founded by uh, tech giants, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and so on. Uh, and it works in a, slight, in a slightly different way than other uh, RDF vocabularies, uh, because its purpose is to annotate web pages so that those tech giants with their search engines can understand better what is in the web pages. Um, and uh, because of that, uh, schema.org is quite huge. It has um, at, uh, at this time 841 types, 1369 properties and uh, some enumeration values. So you see it is huge and we will not go through every class and property defined by schema.org. But you can see an overview on the right hand side of the slide so that you can um, you can have an idea of what uh, what is included in schema.org. Um, and it is what you will typically find in web pages. So, uh, yeah, it's quite a lot. Uh, but back to the way it is created. It is it does not respect the rule that uh, you should reuse what is already defined by other vocabularies instead. Uh, they go the other way around because they are big and huge and uh, backed by the tech giants. So they see a vocabulary that they like and they import it. So they redefine all the IRIs of the things in that vocabulary to be schema.org based. And then they basically force webmasters and creators of content to use the schema.org version because uh, they slowly stop uh, stop. Um, supporting the original vocabulary. And this is the case for FOV and good relations and so on. Um, I personally do not like this approach, but I understand it from, from the po point of view of uh, the tech giants. So this is one, one thing um, that schema.org, uh, in which schema.org is different from other vocabularies. And there is another thing uh, in which schema.org is different. So far, when we talked about data in RDF and vocabularies, uh, we talked about uh, the need to precisely define what is meant by the data, splitting values into, uh, into values and units, for instance, for uh, qualitative, uh, uh, quantitative values and prices and so on, so that the data can be worked with easily from uh, the data consumer perspective, which, of course, is a more work for the data publisher because they need to describe their data properly and um, uh, yeah that takes some work and schema.org um, now goes in a different way and they say let's make the data publishing easy on the publisher and let's deal with cleaning the data later on the consumer side so for instance a schema.org approach to representing uh, the electric anvil that we have seen in good relations is like this. There is a product, it has a name. Note that there is no language tag here in schema.org. And it has three features. Again, we don't know what the features are. So they are generic features. And there is a property name and property value. 
uh, and the name defines what is being meant, uh, what is meant by the property and the value is a literal, but again, no data type and it has internal structure. For instance, for a range of values, there is uh, the, uh, in, in the voltage feature, there is 110 to 220, and it is a structured literal, which goes against everything we talked about in RDF. Um, and for instance, uh, the last feature, safety belt, there is yes, but again, this is not a Boolean, it is a text. And uh, basically what schema.org says, make it easy on publishers so that they publish the data like this, because this is how it is uh, in the human readable pages. And we as data consumers, we will deal with all the inconsistencies and the data cleaning. The problem with this is that uh, the tech giants have the resources to actually clean data, which is published in this way. However, any, uh, any competition like smaller companies and uh, individuals will never have such resources to clean this data. So it increases the barrier of working with the data published on the web in the favor of uh, the tech giants. So that's the other thing I do not like about schema.org. Unfortunately, it does not change the fact that uh, since schema.org is supported by the tech giants and promoted by them, uh, it is being uh, used at least in the uh, uh, for annotation of web pages. Uh, Right, so uh, this is just for you to know that there is an alternative approach to creating vocabularies on the web. Uh, and uh, if uh, you ever manage a website, you will uh, come across annotating uh, the, the need for annotation of that website using schema.org. But you can always have the data published properly as RDF and then somehow downgrade it to this schema.org representation to be embedded in the web pages. So that is the approach I would take. The final thing we'll talk about in today's lecture is Wikidata. It might be, um, for those of you who know what Wikidata is, it might be a bit confusing because today we are talking about vocabularies, but, but Wikidata has a yet different approach to creating an RDF vocabulary than we have seen up to now. So that's uh, why we need to talk about that. Uh, and before we get to the vocabulary, Let's introduce Wikidata a little bit and compare it to DBpedia. Um, both projects have something to do with Wikipedia, which I, I guess all of you know. So Wikipedia is a free encyclopedia, which is human readable. So those are documents that everyone, everyone can edit and um, together we are creating an encyclopedia. However, the problem with that is that um, this information is just human readable and we want uh, this information to become machine readable as well. And um, first there was DBpedia, which took a look at Wikipedia and uh, took a look at those info boxes, which you can see in the slide. And um, those info boxes already contained some structured information. So what they did in DBpedia is that they took all this structured information from those Wikipedia info boxes and they uh, transformed the data into RDF and uh, that's what DBpedia is. DBpedia is queryable via a Sparkle endpoint. It has an RDF representation and anyone can query it. However, the important thing is that DBpedia is created from Wikipedia by um, transforming the info boxes into RDF. On the other hand, Wikidata is a free encyclopedic database. Again, it is a project of uh, the Wikimedia Foundation and um, Wikidata uh, is created the other way around. Um, in Wikidata, you have a structured database of items and facts, and this structured database is um, created and managed by the community. In the same way, you would edit Wikipedia, you can edit the Wikidata structured database. And the goal here is to have all the relevant information in Wikidata first as machine readable, and then later generate part of Wikipedia articles 
based on this wiki data. So that's the main difference between Wikidata and DBpedia. Uh, from, um, or from far away, they both provide some information connected to Wikipedia in a machine readable form via a Sparkle endpoint. That's true. But each of those um, work very differently. So that's uh, what I was trying to explain now. Uh, if you take a look at Wikidata, this is what you will see. Uh, you will see a uh, web page with some structured information and everything you see on that web page is editable. You can edit it when you have your account and um, you can also add your own information. And uh, because we are talking about RDF, uh, the important thing here is that the information that you edit here is then queryable using a Sparkle endpoint. And because uh, when you are querying using a Sparkle, uh, using Sparkle query language, you need to know the RDF vocabulary used to structure the data you are querying. We need to talk about the Wikidata data model. But one more thing before we actually get to that, um, one more term, and that is Wikibase. Wikibase is the software which turns a Wikipedia instance into a structured database. So Wikibase is the structured database created using uh, MediaWiki software, which powers Wikipedia. And Wikidata is one of those Wikibase instances, the most prominent one. Um, however, anyone can create their own instance uh, of a Wikibase. In uh, the Wikibase or Wikidata uh, model, this is uh, how individual items are described. So all things or re uh, RDF resources are uh, called items in Wikidata. So Douglas Adams here is an item in Wikidata. Each item has its identifier or a so-called Q number. So Douglas Adams has a Q number of 42 and um, everything in Wikidata has its own unique Q number. Every item has a, a set of labels in natural languages, a set of aliases and a set of descriptions. In addition, for each Wikidata item, there is a set of statements and each statement has a property. For instance, here we see educate to add and a value such as St. John's College. The value St. John's College, again, is a item with its own Q number. So up to now, we see basically nothing new. This all could be represented directly in RDF uh, if we had the proper uh, vocabulary. What is different in the Wikidata data model is that uh, there is uh, some metadata about those statements. And remember, we already talked about metadata about RDF statements, and we talked about reification, where the statement became um, an entity identified by an IRI, and the original part of the statement, the subject and the predicate and the object, became connected using the RDF subject, RDF predicate, and RDF object predicates. And then we could add some metadata about that statement, for instance, when it was created and where it was scraped from. And uh, it was a universal technique and we could add any uh, metadata to that statement we wanted. In Wikidata, the statements are also reified. So they are represented uh, in the reified way and there is metadata added to those statements. However, uh, this, um, this data model, the Wikidata model, uh, limits the way uh, <clears throat> in which you can add metadata to the statement so that it still uh, is uh, quite manageable. Like items, the properties also have their unique numbers. So educated add, for instance, has a P number, P69. P69 in Wikidata means educated add. Now we have Douglas Adams was educated at St. John's College and there is some more information. There are so-called qualifiers which further describe this statement. So for instance, the statement that Douglas Adams was educated at St. John's College has a qualifier saying that this statement 
um, has end time 1974, start time 1971. There is an academic major uh, in, in English liter literature as a qualifier of this statement and an academic degree, Bachelor of Arts. Again, as a qualifier of this statement, as metadata of the statement that Douglas Adams was educated at St. John College. In addition to qualifiers, there are references because in uh, Wikipedia and Wikidata as well, it is very important to support your statements that you add by references to the sources from which you got the information represented in that statement. So the fact, the statement that Douglas Adams was educated at St. John's College has two references, one to Encyclopedia Britannica Online, there is a URL to, the, to this reference. There is the date uh, when this uh, source was consulted, uh, which is the 7th of December two, 2013 and so on. So those are references, evidence uh, of sources from which this statement was, uh, was taken. Right, so this is how you'll see an item in the Wikidata UI and how you should think about uh, the data behind those items, because those will then be represented in RDF uh, and uh, those will be used to, uh, to be queried. There is one fun fact. If you don't know who Douglas Adams is, he's the writer who wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Pentology. And uh, that is why Douglas Adams has the Q number 42. Now, uh, if we want to query Wikidata, we'll use the Wikidata query service, which is the Sparkle endpoint uh, serving the data in Wikidata. We already talked about Sparkle. <clears throat> However, here we first see what is different in uh, Wikidata. This query searches for goats and their names. So normally with common RDF vocabularies, we, we would have an item of a type goat and the item would have a label. Uh, in Wikidata, the whole vocabulary is created within Wikidata using those Q numbers and P numbers. So the vocabulary, the properties in their URIs are identified by their unique P numbers, which are then reused in the IRIs of those properties. So here, the property with the uh, WDT P31 stands for instance of. So if you search Wikidata, Wikidata for the P31 property definition, you'll see that the property definition is instance of, which is the same as RDF type uh, in the RDF world, but here the property is defined within Wikidata using its uh, P number. And uh, WDQ2934 stands for GOAT. So this query actually searches for items of a type GOAT, but using um, the Wikidata items and Wikidata properties. Now, there is a um, handful service uh, in, uh, in Wikibase, which allows you to uh, not search for um, items of labels explicitly uh, in, in your queries. Instead, you can, um, you can have an item label uh, variable or something label variable in your select clause, which you do not mention in um, in your query. And since uh, you have an item variable um, present there, uh, then the Wikidata query service sees the item label variable as an unbound variable. And uh, it uses the label service to actually query also for labels of that um, item. And uh, you can specify in what language. Uh, here we are searching for uh, labels in English and in the language of the user interface, which is also in English, but uh, that's what the auto language um, in brackets stands for. So like this, uh, you will actually get a list of goats and their names. In this slide, we can see the overview of the Wikidata RDF data model. The first thing is the description of the Wikidata item itself. We will again talk about Douglas Adams, who has the QID uh, Q42. And uh, we can see on the left 
how the description of the Wikidata item itself looks like. We will use a variety of prefixes uh, when talking about the Wikidata RDF model. And uh, this one, WD, uh, stands or uh, is used for uh, the entities themselves. So uh, WD Q42 represents uh, the IRI of Douglas Adams in Wikidata. And we can see how um, the labels are represented. So there is a, the main label, which is represented using RDFS labels, cost prep label and schema name. And then there are aliases um, in the terminology of Wikidata, which are represented as SCOS alt labels. And then there is description, which is represented as schema description. Um, the multilinguality here is very important. And then that is why uh, all the literals uh, naturally contain uh, language tags. Now, uh, we'll move to uh, statements about items, but first we need to uh, explain that statements actually occur in uh, two uh, ways in the RDF data model. There is a so-called truthy value, which we can see in the slide now. One thing I uh, forgot to mention is that each statement has also a rank. And uh, there are three levels of rank for each statement. Uh, the statement can be preferred, normal rank or um, some low uh, low rank. And those ranks uh, can be voted on uh, by the community. And uh, therefore one statement may have multiple different values uh, and each of uh, these values or, or the um, statement value pairs uh, can have a, a different rank. And um, this might be a bit complex if we just want to know the name or, or in this case, the, the date of birth of Douglas Adams. So if there were multiple dates of birth uh, with different ranks, the truthy value represents the uh, statement with the best rank. Um, so um, truthy value is the easiest way you can get to a statement value. Um, note that in this case, the date of birth P569 um, is the 11th of March uh, 1952 and it's a simple XSD date time, um, date time um, literal. So those are the truthy values, the simplest way how to get uh, in the RDF data model to some value. And this is how uh, the, uh, the statement and the value looks like in the Wikidata UI. Now, the statements also uh, appear in the, uh, well, complex uh, representation where we can see all the metadata of the, of the statement as well. So now we see, uh, uh, we see the statement representation and the statement representation is connected again uh, using um, P569, only this time with a different prefix, with prefix P, which connects to the full-blown uh, statement representation. And we can see that um, this statement is the one with the best rank and the rank is normal rank. And uh, again, using different prefixes, we see the statement entity connected to the simple value representation, which is the XSD date time literal. And because uh, date times um, in Wikidata are uh, naturally described by a richer uh, representation, there is a link to the richer representation, uh, which is called a Wikidata value representation or a complex uh, value representation. And you can see this one at the bottom of the RDF representation. There we have the time value, which is the XSD date time literal. But then we have a time precision, a time zone specification, and a time calendar model, because in Wikidata, we can have uh, date times in different calendars. So this one represents the normal Gregorian calendar. And this is how um, editing this uh, complex value looks like in the Wikidata UI. So you can see how these, uh, how these uh, items correspond. Now, when you are editing statements in Wikidata, you are always editing the complex representation. Uh, and the simple representation, which is also used for the truthy values, is then generated for you.
So for querying, you typically need to work with the uh, simple uh, value. However, in some cases, you might need also the complex representation and then you need to know how this representation looks like. So this is Wikidata items and the statements about them. Now I have mentioned that statements have references uh, which link the statement to the sources that uh, we use to create this statement. And uh, each statement uh, can have multiple references and each reference um, can be uh, represented as in, um, as in the slide. So here we have the same statement and then uh, there is the prof was derived from predicate that points to the actual reference. And the reference is again an RDF uh, resource of a type Wikibase re reference. And uh, if we take a look at what is used on the reference, uh, we see that again, uh, the P uh, numbered properties are used here, but this time with the PR prefix, uh, which means that uh, those are properties used in the context of a reference. And those properties are stated in P248, and uh, it links to uh, the Q, uh, QID representation of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Oh, in, in this case, it is Babelia, which is, uh, another, um, which is another database. And there is a special property 3630 for Babelio author ID, which is 2627. And uh, there is P1810 named S, and there is a simple string value Douglas Adams. So this says that the statement comes from Babelio, uh, from a record with this author ID, and that in that, uh, in that source, this author is named as Douglas Adams. So this is a link that everyone can follow and um, verify that the statement uh, is correct or not, maybe. And each reference can be described using, um, using again, multiple properties from, uh, from Wikidata. In this, uh, in this instance, the one reference is described using three properties, each with different values. And again, even the properties used on references can lead to the complex value representations. Um, this is how the reference then uh, looks like in the UI so that you can see how, how the items correspond. And you can see that this particular statement has 14 different references, each described uh, this way or maybe using different properties. And uh, the last, uh, last thing uh, I didn't mention is the qualifiers. So the qualifiers further specify something about, uh, about the statement. So in this case, we'll have a different statement. We'll have a statement uh, connected uh, or made using the 3373 property, which is sibling. So we are going to say that Douglas Adams has a sibling and the sibling is uh, the entity with the QID 1462-3673, Susan Adams. So again, the truthy value is simple. Uh, but then there is the full statement representation, uh, which also uh, links to the uh, QID-based uh, IRI of the Susan Adams entity. But in addition, it has a qualifier. The qualifier, note that the qualifier uses the PQ prefix. Uh, the qualifier uses P1039, which is named kinship to subject and links to uh, a representation of uh, younger sister. So uh, this is what uh, in traditional RDF world would be a class representing all younger sisters. Uh, in Wikidata, younger sister is an entity, uh, an item identified with the QID as any other, and we can use it uh, like this as a value of, uh, of qualifiers or statements and so on. So this statement that Douglas Adams has a sibling and that sibling is Susan Adams has further clarification by qualifying this that uh, uh, the, uh, the kinship to the subject is younger sister. So we actually know and we see it in the data that Susan Adams is a younger sister of Douglas Adams here. And um, again, this is how the qualifier looks like in the UI of Wikidata. So you see that uh, the value is Susan Adams. We can see that the normal rank, which is the small dot to the left of the name of Susan Adams. 
and we see the qualifier type of kinship, younger sister, and there is a reference for this uh, statement as well. So qualifiers and references can be combined and used together and each statement may have multiple qualifiers and multiple references and each reference may have again multiple properties specifying that reference. So it might seem a bit complex uh, at first sight but um, if you take a look at the overview of, uh, of this uh, RDF data model which is in the slides all the time here on the right uh, it is um, not so complex uh, once you get to know it and uh, once you get to use it. Now uh, let's get back to the uh, Wikidata, Wikidata query service which we will use to query Wikidata for a bit. So I already talked about uh, the uh, Wiki, uh, Wikidata query service label service. So here the syntax for federated querying in Sparkle, the service keyword, is used to actually call uh, the um, the Wikidata label service and um, here uh, there is a rule that uh, if an unbound variable in the select clause which is the item label here is of um, or, or is named something label and there is a something variable so in this case there is an item variable and we have uh, the other variable called item label then um, the service searches automatically for a label of item and uh, the value goes into the item label variable without the need of explicitly specifying this in the Sparkle query, which simplifies the Sparkle queries because you typically need, uh, need or want the item and item label for everything and you would have to specify the same patterns over and over again to get to the labels of things, so you can use this. Uh, the same rule applies for alt label. So if you have uh, in the select clause an item and I would add item alt label variable, which would be unbound, then the alias of that uh, item would, uh, would go into that uh, variable automatically. And the same rule is there also for description. So I could add uh, item alt label and item description to just to the select clause and it would get filled using the Wikibase uh, label service. And now uh, in the label service, because Wikidata is multilingual, you need to specify the languages used in the labels. And here uh, we have the auto language, which is the language of the UI, and then English. And the result can be seen again in, uh, in the slide. And there are many more useful services in uh, the Wikidata query service. For instance, here for um, geo-based queries uh, like this one airports within 100 kilometers from Berlin where you can use a Wikibase around service where you specify uh, the location and then some parameters like what is the center what is the radius and what is the uh, what is uh, the distance and based on those parameters the uh, place um, variable gets filled uh, with items whose location is in this, uh, in this radius. So in this case, uh, those, those places uh, would, be, um, would be airports. So we'll get airports within 100 kilometers from Berlin. And the result is, uh, is like this. Uh, this is yet another thing I want to point out. Um, in Wikidata Query Service, there are uh, various visualizers of um, the re uh, results. So this is the um, classic table uh, visualizer of the uh, Sparkle Solutions table. But since this table has a specific format, there are specific columns like location and uh, place and label. You can also switch to a map view of the same data and see uh, the airports on a map, which is in this case a uh, much more uh, friendly uh, result visualization. So this was just a teaser of what is available in Wikidata. I encourage you all to play with Wikidata a little bit uh, to see what is in there. Uh, it is uh, becoming one of uh, the most important data sources in the um, <clears throat> data on the web community.